Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for what I think is going to be an incredibly um, interesting session on aligning the aligning the sound system, um, <laughs> um, uh, on aligning the academic library to its parent, uh, its parent institution, um, uh, university or college. And, um, and I'm, I'm Roger Schoenfeld from Ithaca SNR. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us here today. Um, I'm, I'm joined today by, um, by colleagues um, Anne Houston, who is at uh, Swarthmore College, immediately next to me, Matthew Dames, who is at Notre Dame University, and Jen Fabi, who is at Cal State San Marcos. And uh, all three are the library directors, university librarians of their um, respective institutions. So we've got a really, really great panel. And my, thank you, and my, um, what we're going to be talking about today draws from, draws its inspiration originally from a project that um, that my colleagues, um, Danielle Cooper, who's here with me in the room, um, and Cappy Hill and I did for, um, the Association of Research Libraries and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, in which we were looking specifically at how research libraries could align with their parent university. And so uh, there's a report from that. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, you're most welcome to take a look at it. We won't be speaking specifically from that project here today. But, um, but Katina and Leah and I, when we were thinking about some programming that might be a good fit for the conference, thought that it would be really interesting to explore the issue of library, university, library college um, alignment from, um, from multiple kinds of institutional perspectives. And so, uh, so we're here today to do, to do that. Um, maybe I will, um, uh, so, so the for, our format today is, is a series of questions that I'm gonna be posing to, um, to our panelists. Um, and uh, and so let let me let's get let's get started. Um, so um, so it's important. Um, well, I'm going to argue. I would argue if the questions were being put to me that it is important to align with your parent institution. But I'm here to ask the question. So um, I'm going to start with a question about: Is it important to align with your parent institution? And if so, why? And are there times where being out of alignment is appropriate or even important? Um, so I think I'm supposed to turn to Jen to kick us off with that one. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, good to Zoom with you. So I'll, I'll just give a little bit of background for context. Um, I, the California State University San Marcos is part of the 23 campus CSU system. And that is argu arguably the largest public university system in the U.S. Um, my campus is in the middle in terms of number of students and the third youngest, so a baby. Um, each campus is, so this California State University San Marcos system is meant to cover the state of California in terms of accessibility to a four-year degree. And the example that I'll give um, about when it may be important to be out of alignment is one that really is more of a campus decision. But first I would say, you know, is it willful misalignment or is it our job as deans or directors to help make the case for something that is new or different or doesn't seem to be in alignment? So I'll give a quick example. Um, our campus is 33 years old and has never paid attention to the enrollment target that has been given to us by the system. Uh, mostly because of just the completely wholehearted belief in providing access to a college degree. So we would admit many more students than the target. And it was willful misalignment. Um, we actually paid fines some years uh, in order to be able to admit more students. This is fully paid off. Um, we're here uh, at the demographic cliff in California, finally, for the first time. Um, we all knew it was coming, but I don't think it, many of us paid attention. Um, we are one of the only, the three CSU out of 23 that have met the target this year. Everyone else is under target. So that willful misalignment, I think, um, paid off for our campus um, many years into in the future. So I think I'll hand it over to whoever's next. Um, Matthew, would you like to go next? 
Sure. Um, I think it's also appropriate for a little bit of uh, context. So I'm at the University of Notre Dame. It's a, um, I guess we would call it an R1 institution, high research. Um, I got there about, uh, about a year ago, August of 2021. And when I was recruited there, the, the provost said that they, the University of Notre Dame actively wanted to increase its um, research visibility and reputation. And fortunately, um, unlike a lot of other of my sort of ARL colleagues, they, the administration there felt that the university library system was integral to elevating that reputation. And so part of my remit is certainly to be in line with that, and I never want to be willfully out of line with my boss because that has employment implications that may be negative. <laughs> uh, but I do think that there is an opportunity, certainly for us, and I think at some other campus institutions, to be slightly out of alignment. And here's what I mean by that. At least at Notre Dame, part of uh, part of the opportunity that we have on our campus is to lead the, uh, lead the campus maybe three years out and perhaps do some experimentation about the direction of scholarship and the direction of research so that we can forecast for the campus where that is going. And in order to do that, you necessarily have to take some risks that may not be in line with um, the, what you're doing today. And I think we have the opportunity to take those risks and to do that sort of research so that we can see 36 to 48 months out uh, what the future of research and scholarship is going to be so that we can help forecast for the rest of the campus. So in essence, we are strategically being out of alignment. Thanks. So um, I'm coming from um, a liberal arts college environment, and um, one that's, I, I've been actually at three different liberal arts colleges, and all well-funded institutions, just that caveat, but I'm speaking from my personal experience in that environment, and um, the colleges that are in the Oberlin group, which is a group that some of you may be familiar with, it's 80 liberal arts college libraries across the country, have actually talked a little bit with Roger and with Ithaca about doing a similar study to the one that, um, that they did for ARL institutions to see how our um, concept of alignment and what that means in a liberal arts college might match up. So, um, of course, we haven't done that yet. We're still interested in doing it. Um, so I'm speaking a little bit just from personal experience here. Um, I think in the liberal arts college, you know, we obviously our institutional strategy is always going to center on student learning. It's the most important thing in our environment. Um, that said, I think we do share a lot of um, institutional strategies that are similar to what we're seeing reflected in the Ithaca report, such as an increasing interest in STEM. Um, for us, it's more student-focused. It's a growth in students in those majors and a decline in um, you know, the traditional liberal arts majors. Um, we're seeing an increasing diversity of our student body. We're seeing growth strategies. A lot of liberal arts colleges are actually um, experiencing planned growth. So in our environment, I do think the concept of alignment is, is fairly straightforward. A library that didn't have an overall explicit focus on student learning and student engagement um, would, as Matthew said, it would be, it would at best be seen as irrelevant um, and out of alignment with what my boss wants me to do, and we would struggle to be well resourced. So, but I do think there are a couple of cases where we might be out of alignment, and here I'm echoing my colleagues, that I really think our professional values as librarians, our desire to innovate, move us towards strategies that the upper level leadership of the institution um, might not see as directly relevant yet, such as strongly investing in digital scholarship in the classroom. Um, so I think in that case, um, the library can be ahead of its institution and therefore a bit out of alignment, and maybe that's not a bad thing. The other thing I'd mention, which I think we're going to get into a little bit more in a later question, is that the concept of institutional strategy um, 
can, can differ, and sometimes the faculty think it's one thing, the leadership thinks it's another, and those two things can compete with each other. And so I think whether we're in alignment, um, it, we have to sort of uh, decide which of those we are going to be more explicitly in alignment with. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Well, it's the perfect uh, segue, so th <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, so we're, you know, as, as you're pointing to, um, it's not always straightforward to determine um, what is the strategy of the institution that you're aligning with, right? Like in some cases, there's a strategic plan for the university. The strategic plan has five bullets on it and you know, there's a pro been a process through which that's been determined. Um, but institutions, institutions are complex. Universities are very, very complex. Um, they have multiple kinds of stakeholders. There's um, often competing agendas. The dean of this school wants to do this thing. The um, faculty senate wants, you know, is more interested in that thing. The provost has this set of, of directions that they're trying to pursue. Um, can, can you tell me, I mean, may, and maybe we'll start with, with you. Can you tell me about a challenge, tell us about a challenge you faced in balancing between some of those competing needs for multiple stakeholders? Sure, so um, there are at least two things that I can think of, and I think one is um, the faculty may have this very different, as I said, different idea of what the strategy is, and the faculty is actually more consistent over time um, in terms of creating the culture of the institution, and I think that culture can um, actually substitute in a way for strategy, um, and if you think about like one challenge that I've faced, and I think probably others in this room have faced, is this um, persistent turnover in top leadership. So, um, you know, presidents and provosts may have terms of seven to eight years at the most. You know, I've um, worked under provosts that's turned over every two to three years, um, and presidents that didn't, you know, stay more than three to five. So I think, you know, as that, as that happens, there is this sort of underlying faculty culture that really creates the culture of the institution, and that can create strategy which just kind of persists over time. So you have a leader coming in, a new leader comes in, there may be a delay in the time after they get there in setting a new institutional strategy, so you're waiting for that to happen, and in the meantime, that underlying culture just takes over and the institution persists the way it is. Then they start to set their agenda, and in liberal arts colleges, you know, there can be significant disagreement, and I guess this is another challenge, over what it means to be a liberal arts college, with faculty having very strong feelings about what a liberal arts education is, and when the top leadership comes in and, for example, says, we want more business and entrepreneurship programs, the faculty can push back very strongly at that, and the library can get caught in the middle of that, um, that kind of uh, tension over trying to change to be a little bit more of a practical curriculum and the faculty saying, no, we are liberal arts, and that means that we stick to um, a certain type of learning. So I think really that challenge um, of turnover and that tension that it creates um, with faculty is one of the things that I've really experienced a lot of. Thanks, Matthew, can I turn, turn the same question to you? Is there a um, challenge that you faced in balancing those competing needs that, that you'd be willing to share with us? So, some some of this some of this is a little complicated for me to answer just because I look at it in slightly different ways. So we're we're mm -hmm. in a strategic framework process. We're in the third phase of that. It's been going very well. Um, and in a lot of ways, people say, "Well, what are you going What are you going to do?" And I say, "I'm going to do." Uh, what our stakeholders tell me that they need us to do, but I can't be everywhere at one at at the same time. So basically, the first, second, and third pieces of the strategic framework for me are about talent. How do I get the best, sharpest people in the room to help me? get the intelligence that we need to chart the course. Now, in some ways, people say, well, that's obvious, but actually it really isn't obvious at all because most people, they'll go through and they'll do this whole, they'll do the whole gussied up plan and it'll look nice, read wonderfully, not, looks nice on a shelf, but then 
if circumstances like a COVID come around and you have to pivot, then that plan is going to continue to stay on that shelf looking nice and you're going to have to do something else. In contrast, if I've got really sharp people in the room, those people can pivot to whatever and, and to operate efficiently and excellently under any sort of environmental circumstances that we see. And so, yes, there are some, and that's part of the reason we talk, talk about strategic frameworks as opposed to a plan. We know that we want to elevate Notre Dame's uh, research reputation. We know that's important. We know that that means additional support for STEM and so on and so forth. But if something happens where we have to figure, figure out a new way to implement that goal, then the people that I recruit and re retain are going to be in the best position to advise me on how to do that. And it's interesting to think about the talent, the talent angle in, um, in that, that alignment. I think we'll probably come back to that a little further as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jen, um, we'll turn to you now. Um, thank you. I, I so connect with both of the answers of my colleagues um, to the point of talent and bringing people along, right, with um, the vision is uh, something that one of my mentors used to say, which was, I will kick down these doors, but I need some people to walk through them. <laughs> and um, that was something that we always, uh, you know, talked about in terms of bringing people along. Um, when I think about this question, I thought about it also a little bit differently. And that, that was how um, the library leader's knowledge and values are aligned to the institution's mission and values. So um, I came from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where I had been for 15 years. Um, at the time that I left, the mission or vision was to go to um, from research intensive to research extensive. And one of the last things that I did was um, conceptualize a medical library for um, our new school of medicine. And so I then went into a master's comprehensive university. And for me, coming out of um, student learning and information literacy, teaching and learning, it was really important to me to align my knowledge abilities, desires to be a leader in an organization where it was, you know, student first um, and that the library was 100% focused on undergraduate students. So when I think about this, um, I think that a, a leader aligning with the type of institution that they're going to and the mission and values of that institution can help to avoid some challenges. Um, one other thing that I'll say the uh, the institution where I am now um, has had the same vision, mission, and values had for 15 years with no further strategic plan. So we have now um, a president who's been there for three years, a provost who's been there for two years, and a, a new strategic plan. And I, I have breathed a sigh of relief because um, that now really allows us to align better um, than we might have done in the in the past, um, because there are some things articulated in writing. Um, I will say one of the challenges that I've had is that in the absence of a strategic plan or even with a strategic plan, data has been incredibly important to bring to the table when it comes to uh, speaking with, making the case to, and aligning with um, my administration on campus. And I think that this is something that I've had to bring our library employees along with, especially our library faculty, in terms of this not being distasteful. Um, shouldn't people just understand that libraries are inherently good and we should get resources and make independent decisions? And so that is a challenge, I think, just this, you know, being very focused on data, getting the data, putting it into the right format, and helping those within the library understand how important it is to, um, speak in multiple uh, modes as we're moving forward and making the case for what the library is attempting to do. 
So interesting to hear data, talent, and culture as three, three different themes coming out of those answers. Um, so uh, on the next question, Matthew, maybe I'll start with you. Um, can, and uh, here, here what I'm interested in is, you know, we've, the, the panel has individuals from three different kinds of institutions and individuals with actually fairly deep experience from those kinds of institutions. Matthew, you've been at a number of research universities in senior executive roles and in the context of liberal arts colleges, Jen, in the context of, of comprehensive teaching and, 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 and uh, uh, universities. Um, and so I'm kind of, I'm quite interested in how different the environment, the, the strategic environment is to which you have to align in those different contexts, or if that's as different as we might, we might imagine. So um, can each of you, and Matthew, we'll start with you, can you, can you share maybe one of the most important strategic priorities? It could be at your current college or university, or maybe at a previous one. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be at the current one. But, um, but at the university level, right? Like what, what, and you've made reference to one or two of them already, but can you just give us one, one or two examples there? So what I find a lot, so I've been at uh, Notre, Notre Dame is my fourth institution. And the commonalities between those institutions is that everybody is seeking to be um, an elite research institution. And I've, the, all four are private, large research universities. So they're all looking to be elite research institutions. Not all of those institutions have the financial resources to be elite <laughs> scientific in, uh, no. institutions. I mean, it's just, that's just the fact. And I think one of the outcomes of COVID is that the divide between the financial haves and have-nots will really start to manifest themselves, particularly for universities that have been pursuing the elite uh, STEM discipline, STEM-oriented research university model, and they're going to find, you know, the cash is a little short, and it's not going to get better. Um, the one thing that's been different here, here being at Notre Dame, in terms of st strategy is that um, I was pretty clear going in that um, my primary objective was to significantly elevate in terms of talent um, and that what that meant is that when you saw sort of the outcomes on paper of the strategic framework that we put together, it was actually going to look kind of boring and you needed to be ready for it to look boring on paper, but you also needed to be ready for, for me to do what I do best, which is bring in really elite talent and get them to work together and g give them opportunities. And that the payoff for that would not be evident until maybe two or three years down the line. And Notre Dame so far has been very receptive to that approach in ways that some of my prior institutions haven't. Yeah, maybe we'll turn to Jen now just to break up the linearity here. So Jen, really interested to hear, um, you know, one of the most important strategic directions of your, your current or, or another institution that you've, that you've worked with. All right, I, there are so many, um, and it's, it's really difficult for me to, to land on one, but I would say that the most important strategic priority of my institution, my campus, um, is social mobility. And um, that's really just even the terminology of social mobility is something that our new president has brought with her to um, Cal State San Marcos. But um, basically, you know, affecting through attainment of a college degree and, um, you know, next step employment, uh, affecting generations to come of um, families. And you know, this is something that is an interesting one for the library to connect with. But I think that more, um, you know, more concrete is one that um, this, the, when I was thinking about this question and kind of comparing it to the university system and university that I, that I came from, and it's been, you know, admittedly eight and a half years now, um, 
a focus on and strategy to support student basic needs is something that I was not I was not used to. Um, and one of the ways that this has completely translated into the library is um, in terms of course material affordability and and OER. Um, we do this is state law in California that we are actively reducing the cost of course materials that students have access to everything they would have to purchase before they register for a course. I mean that we're actively working towards zero zero cost major zero cost course materials. Um, this is something that has completely changed our collection development policy. I mean, I'm so used to collection development policies that are the library collection does not include textbooks. And that is completely the opposite of where we are. Um, so just in terms of student basic needs, uh, economic justice, those are things that are very important, um, not only in the state of California, not only in my institution, but across the entire CSU system. Thanks. Um, Ann. Sure. So um, I think one thing that distinguishes the small college environment, um, and I've worked in larger places as well in some R1 institutions, the thing that I really see that's different is the focus on each student as a person. Um, it's not just about student learning, but about individual students and how they can develop as individuals. And I think that's what makes us an appealing choice for many students. Um, who need that kind of um, personal attention to really grow, as opposed to larger places that might offer a broader sort of scope of opportunities. So we can bring more resources to bear on the experience of an individual um, student. And I, I think that's important, not just because we believe in it as a value of, of what a liberal arts college does, because, but because it's what we're selling. Um, that's why it's worth the cash to come to a small college. It's a strategic direction, a strategic priority, but it's also an existential need. If we don't do that well, we don't have our reason to exist. And I have to say, I, there is probably not a liberal arts college out there. I'm going out on a limb here a little bit, but I think with the, the exception of a few, and my institution might be one of them, there's not a liberal arts college out there that is not scared right now. Because the model is under question, and a lot of them have, um, have struggled financially. So I think you know, we really need to be able to develop that piece of our program or we're not going to exist. So for the library, I think those metrics of what we do to show success are important to aligning. But I also think that sort of, you know, when libraries do things that really impact a small number of students in a really profound way, that's actually okay. And that might not go over so well at a larger institution where it might, you might say, well, that's a boutique project, that's a boutique thing, it doesn't really affect students on a large scale. For us, that can actually be okay because it's showing that value um, that we bring to the student experience. So I think you know, another important implication is that the allocation of resources may lean towards ensuring that no student falls through the cracks. And you have to make the library relevant in that regard. Like, what do we do to stop any student from falling through the cracks? And if you, you, know, if you can't make a compelling case for that, the resources are gonna go elsewhere as the college grows. Which all of this isn't to say that faculty research isn't important, but it tends to be important because it helps us retain good faculty who want to teach in that environment but also want their research to be, you know, to continue to do their research. So we really want to support it. We try to support it, um, even though the student, um, it really does come down to the student ultimately for us. I, I really, really appreciate the um, candor in the range of answers on that question because I feel like it really illustrates that running an outstanding academic library in one kind of institution cannot be the same as in another. And, you know, Matthew, you, you pushed us even a little further in pointing out that even in institutions that may on paper or in terms of Carnegie classifications or what have you um, seem similar to one another, that there are real resource differences that make strategies more or less realistic, right? And I, I think that was, that's, that's a really, really important observation as well. Um, you all are deeply experienced library executive leaders, and one of the things that, um, that I've observed in um, both in conversations with leaders like yourselves, but also in conversations with presidents and chief academic officers uh, and so forth, is that the actual work of bringing the library organization into alignment with or 
you know, maybe sometimes intentional misalignment with, okay, we talked about that as well, um, uh, the, the university or college is not something that all library leaders are equally well positioned to, to do successfully. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are, you know, there, there is a, um, a, a, we could call it a, a, you know, a set of expectations that, um, that many libraries have about what it means to do their, do their work and what excellence looks like and how that gets measured. That's sometimes developed from within. It sometimes comes from the field or the profession more, um, more widely. So I think this is a real, you know, this is our closing question, a real moment to think about some of the leadership lessons that you've taken that you've drawn um, in terms of how to get the library organization, um, the strategy of the library, the operations of the library, the, the people, the talent of the library um, aligned with the, li the larger institution. Is that something that, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you've learned that might, might, work, um, might work well there? Um, Jen, maybe we'll start with you and then close with our panelists in person. Okay, um, so I mean, this this question is something that I am, you know, I thought back back across my career. I even did some um, Google Scholar searching of some of my first publications because I've always talked about strategic hooks, um, and it was a it was a term that I couldn't find that existed at the time when I started talking about that. Um, and really that is what is there in the larger organization that's important to that organization that the library can reach down and hook onto or reach up and hook onto, however that looks. Um, you know, I started talking about this when I was a, an education librarian in, you know, the early 2000s or late 90s. Um, and it was about what does the curriculum look like? Um, how do we map information literacy to the curriculum so that we're able to um, have an impact there and influence the curriculum? So I've been thinking about this for a really long time. Uh, later in my career, I worked on a general education reform, was actually reassigned from the library to the provost office to do that. And I cannot tell you how important it was to know what mattered to people and what mattered to different stakeholders and, and different groups. And not only what mattered, it's the knowing part. And that's where you know, we work for better or worse in extreme hierarchy, all of us, I'm sure. And um, making sure that the library has a parallel position or person that can be at almost every table is really important to me, I think, in terms of knowing what is important to people. So you have an associate dean's group, that's great. I have an associate dean. I don't care if you're 90% talking about how to, how to uh, the course schedule for the, the next year, because then the 10%, there are some, there are going to be things that are important to our campus that come up that we need to know about in order to hook on to them. Same with department chairs. Okay, well, we don't exactly have department chairs, but we have department heads, that counts. And you know, just make sh making sure that we're at every table we can possibly be at, um, not only to educate people about what the library does and can do, um, but also to understand what is important to groups on our campus on our campuses. So the, I think those are the lessons that I've learned uh, that are most relevant and important to this discussion. Thanks, um, Anne. Would you like to go next? Sure. So I I agree with a lot of what Jenna said, and I would say. Um, in addition, that getting out there and being at every table and talking to everyone, I think the ultimate goal should be that they see you as a collaborator and not um, just as somebody who is, not, not that this is what you're saying, Jeb, but somebody who's sitting there, but somebody who they actually um, see as somebody they work with when they are making decisions. And that can be a little hard for library leaders to get there, um, but I think if you can get there, that's really, um, really important. You know, one point that I really appreciated in the Ithaca report um, that I think is relevant everywhere is that presidents and provosts want the head of the library to function as a member of the campus-wide leadership and not just an advocate for the library. So, and I really, that point really resonated with me, you know, that, that if you can um, be seen as part of the leadership, truly as part of the leadership, a decision maker um, that they want to consult and that they want to work with, um, I think that's really important. 
I think another um, lesson that I've learned is that you need to, we talk a lot about managing up. Um, managing down um, is also important. Um, make sure that your um, library staff understand the institutional <laughs> strategy and don't blame up or complain about the strategy if you don't, even if you don't agree with it, don't say that to your staff. Take their feedback and their perspective and convey it up in a way that is nuanced and focuses on the good of the institution. So, you know, you don't, you know, instead of just, um, you know, saying, oh, I don't like what the leadership is doing, um, say, well, why, why do you, the library staff, what do you have to contribute to this? And then find a way to, to um, take that higher up and, um, and, and help us lead, the library lead the way. Um, we should trust in our ability um, to influence the institutional strategy. So how can your staff um, be a part of that? And then just repeating what I said before, um, as a piece of advice, be prepared for the leadership to change, because um, it will, and connect with new leadership when it comes in, and, um, and have, use your influence um, as on campus. Matthew. So I think the, one of the biggest lessons, this is my third leadership position, one of the biggest lessons is um, sort of the importance and the power of um, serving. I'll just say the assist because it's basketball season. So I said this, I said this to my provost um, within the last couple of months. Um, I actually have uh, several different roles depending upon sort of the, the forum. And he's a big basketball fan, and he likes the Golden State Warriors. So I, I made it plain to him. I said, so, uh, you know, when it comes to leading the library's organization, I have to act as sort of Steve Kerr, the coach. When it comes to um, working with the other deans and um, the various stakeholders on campus, my role really is as Draymond Green. I'm supposed to sort of do a lot of the, the things that don't show up in the box score that, but that are critically important to organizational and team success. When it comes to, you know, my field, I'm pretty sure I'm Steph Curry. <laughs> but right now where we are, I need to put, I need to put Steph aside and to put that on the shelf um, and right now what's so important is for me to play the Steve Kerr, uh, Steve Kerr role, the Draymond Green role and to set other people up for success because once we get those folks set up for success and they're rolling, I can get my shot anytime I want. And so I think, however, at least at the, you know, the big ARLs, a lot of the ARL institutions have constructs where the, um, the librarians have faculty status or they're tenured. And in a lot of situations, and we're calibrating this at Notre Dame, it's sort of you want to, a lot of folks want to do their own research and be more in the Steph Curry role. Right. First of all, there's only room but for so many Steph Currys on a team. Um, but the power for us really is to be um, Draymond Green in, in setting other people up, um, getting, connecting them to each other, connecting them to not just information but um, answers that expand the capacity of what they're able to do. Um, and I, so ultimately that leads to scenarios where I think there is uh, power in just really exceptional service. And you can excel in service without being servile. Thank you. I think those are some really powerful lessons, actually, from all three panelists that we can probably all of us learn in almost any, uh, uh, any role we play in uh, any kind of organizational context. Um, we're going to have a few minutes. I think we have about five minutes for questions. So if there is a, a question or two, we're happy to entertain them. 
Um, let me just take a look and see. I'll bring the microphone to you. Okay. And, and while people are thinking of questions, let me just, uh, this is a very nice crowd for Friday afternoon uh, on, the, on the last day of at least the in-person, so thank you for coming out. Thank you. Great. Well, let's let's uh, let's close things there. Thanks, everyone, so much. I think this was a terrific session. Thank you, Matthew and Jen. I feel like we had a real rock star, uh, basketball star uh, crowd, uh, and uh, greatly, greatly appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, I